Good evening, everyone. Welcome. The UCLA Center for Mexican Studies and the Institute for Latin American Studies welcomes you. Uh, we're in for a very special treat. So first, let me start by um, doing our land acknowledgement. The Center for Mexican Studies at UCLA acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongba people. We welcome you to this webinar where we're presenting the book, uh, Stories That Make History, Mexico through Elena Poniatowska's Chronicas. So um, we have the author, Lynn Stevens, and a commentator, Juan Villoro. So let me, uh, we're gonna start with the author doing some remarks. Let me, I'm gonna introduce Lynn first, and then I'll introduce uh, Juan. And, uh, and then the author will give some remarks about the book, and then the commentator, um, Juan, will give us uh, uh, his comments, and then we'll engage the audience, and hopefully we'll get some questions from all of you. So this is a real uh, uh, honor, privilege, and uh, pleasure to introduce to you all Lynn Steven. She's, uh, Lynn Steven is an academic expert on immigration, asylum, and gender asylum in the United States. She is um, the uh, distinguished professor of arts and sciences, professor of anthropology at the University of Oregon, and a participating faculty member in ethnic studies, Latin American studies, and women and gender studies. She founded the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies, and she has written or edited 12 books and she's the author of more than 90 academic articles. Also, she was the president-elect and president of the Latin American uh, Studies Association from June 1st, 2018 to June 1st, 2019. The, she's presenting her most recent publication, a Stories That Make History, Mexico through Elena Poniatowska's Chronicas and used to uh, read a little bit from the abstract on the uh, jacket, it says, from covering the massacres of students at La Telolco in 1968 and the 1985 earthquake to the Zapatista rebellions in 1994 and the disappearance of 43 students in 2014, Elena Poniatowska has been one of the most important chroniclers of Mexican social, cultural, and political life. In stories that make history, Lynn Steven examines Poniatowska's writings, activism, and political participation, using them as a lens through which to understand critical moments in contemporary Mexican history. And with that, I'll give you the floor, Lynn. Thank you for being here and presenting your work. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Gaspar. I want to acknowledge that I'm a settler guest on Kalapuya Ilahi, which is where the University of Oregon is located. This is the traditional indigenous homelands of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the US government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, Kalapuya descendants are primarily citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Round and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, and they continue to make important contributions to their communities, the University of Oregon, the state, and the world. Um, first, I wanna thank Gaspar Rivera and the Center for Mexican Studies, the Latin American Institute, and the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment at UCLA. And I also want to say uh, thank you and how excited I am to be in conversation with Juan Villoro and thank him for taking the time to read my book uh, and to be here today. Um, so I am now going to share my screen. I'm going to give a little tour of the book, uh, talk a little bit about how and why I wrote it. Historical moments when the status quo is cracked open, when people take to the streets and demand change, when another seem, future seems possible are the moments when gifted writers and artists step up. 
the ways that pandemics, massacres, earthquakes, and broad social movements for change are represented and documented can determine their place in history. We might be on a day like that today with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the rebalancing of power in Europe. I suggest that Elena, Elena Poniatowska is one such writer who chronicles Mexican history starting from 1968. In the book, I talk about the chronica centered in emotional connections forged through writing about politics. The central concept of the book is strategic emotional political community. Chronica sit at the crossroads of fiction and nonfiction. Poniatowska forged direct emotional connections between the oral testimonies of the story she tells and readers. Channeling her ability to create complex and rich characters from her novels, Poniatowska uses the same techniques to communicate the full humanity of those whose stories she shares and links them to larger political, economic, and social relations and structures a project I share as an ethnographer. I wrote this book for a broad English speaking public, particularly in the US, because I have been amazed over my 30 years of speaking, writing and teaching, how few people, including many students, know of Poniatowska's work, let alone more recent Mexican history. I'm interested in how testimony forges emotional connections. How do people giving public testimony on repression and traumatic events and those listening become emotionally connected to one another? Can they, through this connection, act together to denounce, document, and engage in obtaining social justice, racial justice? Are they part of emotional communities tying speakers, listeners, and readers to difficult and tragic events? Part of my ideas come from the concept of emotional community proposed by Colombian anthropologist Miriam Jimeno as a way of positing how people can become connected through traumatic events. I'm interested in particular in how oral narrative and chronicas and public performances by writers can bring listeners and readers into community with the stories that are told. Beyond that, I'm interested in the ways that these connections can influence politics. The transfer of oral testimonies that are written, textualized, and shared widely can play an important role in whose voices are heard and by whom. Testimonies widely disseminated can influence the ways that historical events are remembered and canonized. Stories that make history suggest that the ways that people's stories linked to pandemics, massacres, earthquakes, and broad social movements are rem remembered represented and documented can determine their place in history. Compelling forms of writing and other forms ex of expression and performance are also central to political life. The idea of emotional strategic political community does not involve strategic essentialism, but strategies of representation that can become political tools for influencing change. Emotion channeled through in-depth testimonies and stories on the page and in person creates connection between people that may be intense or muted, that endures or fades or is rekindled with time. Emotional connection is forged on the ground and can result in the creation of emotional and political community in the moment. The strategic writing involved in documenting and representing such connections and communities may also result in the building of an emotional political community among those who read such accounts and through their reproduction and memorialization. Political performances are also strategies that build emotional political community in the moment and through time. Elena Poniatowska was drawn to documenting already existing or evolving strategic emotional political communities, as well as helping foster them through her writing and political performances. Strategic emotional political community as used in this book is a flexible concept with multiple dimensions that include on the ground face-to-face -face networks and community building, the representation of such communities in text and the possibility of communities of readers. 
Strategic, emotional, political communities are not fixed and necessarily stable through time. People may move in and out of them, they ebb and flow. At a larger level, writers such as Poniatowska and others, including our commentator, worked actively to create, preserve, and expand what we might call a strategic, emotional, political community in Mexico on the left that has been a guiding light for politics for decades. This has been an important contribution to supporting a broad critical public and processes of democratization in Mexico. Through straddling the line between activism and journalism, writing and action, Ponya Tosca has been an important public intellectual and political figure in Mexico. How did I come to write this book? I first met Elena when she came to the University of Oregon in May of 2010. Um, I did some translation for her. I took her to some used bookstores and we had tea and hung out. Um, that following September, I was teaching a course at the UNAM and she invited me to lunch at her house. I began, uh, I think I had three or four lunches with her. And while I was <laughs> on a treadmill, um, I thought of the idea of writing a book about her uh, and trying to begin with her testimony. Um, I began initially interviewing her for about three days in August of 2011. Um, and it's a little bit uh, like interviewing Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> someone who's interviewed thousands of people. Um, so in the course of our conversations that continued um, for several years, I proposed to her a book um, about her work, particularly Cronicas, and her as a political actor um, in Mexico. And she became interested in that idea because no one had written about her work and its impact uh, directly on Mexican politics or conceived of her as a political uh, actor. Um, I drafted an initial uh, chapter in the introduction in 2016. I had a sabbatical year where I drafted the remainder of the book uh, in conversation uh, with several historians, particularly historians of the press. Um, I worked with an editor to rewrite it for a general audience. And I also uh, am very appreciative that I had access uh, to the Fundacion Ponya Tosca, where I was able to visit the archive, look at photographs uh, before it closed in Mexico City due to COVID. So I'll just say a short word uh, for people in the audience who may not know a lot about Elena Ponya Tosca, although I suspect through this audience they do. Um, she identifies herself as a journalist, a publisher, an author of novels, short stories, cronicas, children's stories, a political activist, and a, as a mother and a grandmother. Um, she's the daughter of a French father of Polish royal origin, Jean Poniatowski, and a Mexican mother, Paula Amor, born in Paris in 1932. And she moved to Mexico at the age of 10 in 1942. Elena was educated in a French school in Mexico City, a Catholic girls school in the US, and she returned to Mexico and learned to type and take shorthand. In 1953, she began her career as a reporter for the society column of the Excelsior newspaper, and she's been writing ever since. So before we turn it over uh, to Juan, I just wanna sort of tour through the chapters um, of the book. Uh, Mexico City's growing political public news and publishing 1959 to 1985. Um, this was a very important chapter um, and the one that I learned the most about um, because I have not worked as a historian of the press. Um, and I felt it was very, very important before talking about her work to provide some context about publishing uh, in Mexico broadly and in Mexico City. Um, particularly looking at um, sort of pushing back against the idea that the PRI had a lock on the press until really the 1980s and looking at other forms uh, of publishing that could include things like the Revista de la Universidad, 
cultural supplements to more mainstream papers, um, publications like Porqué and Siempre, um, sort of tabloids or Nota Rojas that's been explored by historian Pablo Picato and others. Um, and also the founding of presses like uh, Siglo XXI, Era, Planeta, and sort of the histories of those. And then uh, the founding of La Jornada, Proceso, and other publications in the, in the 1980s. Um, the second chapter uh, looks at the 1968 student movement and massacre sort of centered on La Noche de Tlatelolco. Um, and one of the things that I did um, for the book and in relation to this chapter was to do a survey of readers, of Mexican readers, uh, of what had they read of Elena Poniatowska. And this book uh, came to the, to the top and was something recognized by many different generations um, of folks. It has been taught in schools in Mexico, has been passed down in families. Um, so I thought that was a really uh, interesting aspect of the impact of this book. Um, the third chapter is called uh, 1985 Earthquake, Civil Society and a New Political Future. Um, and I chronicle Elena's documentation of the earthquake. Um, also try to look at um, what came out of that in terms of civil society and focus on some of the key actors that are actually both in her book. And then I sort of read that against the testimonio of Miguel de la Madrid um, that kind of treats some of the same actors. It's almost as if they're uh, in conversation. Um, and of course, uh, the birth of the PRD and the impact of that on, in politics on, in, in Mexico and particularly in Mexico City. Uh, the next chapter is called Engaging with the EZLN, and it's, it's probably the longest, most complex, maybe somewhat wonky chapter. Um, and, and I know Juan was also very engaged with the Zapatistas and wrote, a great, wrote about them. Um, and in this chapter, um, I look at Elena sort of engaging with Marcos, um, but more importantly, engaging with Zapatista women um, and Zapatista sort of gender uh, politics um, and looking at uh, women in the EZLN. And I also bring into this chapter her own sort of, uh, I would call it almost a reluctant engagement initially with feminism, discussion of abortion, and then as revealed in a pretty recent uh, novel of hers, her own sexual assault um, and sort of uh, life as a single mother um, in the initial, when her uh, first son, uh, Mane, was born. Um, the next chapter uh, looks at the book Amanecer en el Zócalo, uh, when the current president of Mexico and let's see, his first attempt <laughs> occupied the Zócalo for 50 days. Um, this is a book of Elena's that has really not received a lot of critical attention um, like other ones, but I think it's very important, particularly in understanding her as a political actor. Um, she documents what goes on in the planton. She discusses the limits and challenges of the formal political system in Mexico and social movements and their interface. Um, she looks at what does it mean to be a political actor, and she really, I think, interrogates um, the process that happened with the consulta in the Socolo. And it's interesting that she foreshadows, shall we say, some questions about the current president of Mexico that would, would very much be on the table today. And she also interrogates um, politics. The final chapter um, I call Regresenlos, the 43 disappeared students from Ayotzinapa. Um, and I follow, I, I use one, one performance, one public speech, 
that she gave in the Sokolo and also sort of document the use of uh, public platforms such as Ferias de Libro and other sort of public performances um, to really open up public space um, for the family members of these 43 students. Um, and I guess it's hard to end the book on this note because we still have no answers uh, about these students. And um, I'll just leave it there. And I look forward very much to hearing uh, Juan's commentary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn, for that uh, uh, survey of your different chapters of your book. And now let me, I have the privilege of introducing our commentator, our distinguished commentator, Juan Villoro. Juan Villoro is a writer and journalist, a native of Mexico City, where he's been a professor at UNAM. And also he's been a visiting professor at several universities in the United States, such as Yale, Princeton, Stanford, and also at Pompeu Fabra in uh, Barcelona, Spain. Also, he's um, He's uh, uh, been a visiting professor at Fundación de Nuevo Periodismo, created by Gabriel García Márquez. And he's a columnist for uh, 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 the Daily Reforma in Mexico City. And also he published and writes for um, an international audience through the New York Times, El País from Spain, and El Mercurio in Chile. Uh, he's, uh, he has a very distinguished uh, career as a writer. He's a recipient of uh, very many important prizes for his literary production. So he's the 2018 recipient of the Jose Donoso Premio Iberoamericano, and also uh, of uh, the award, the Manuel Rojas Award, uh, both of these from Chile. And also in Mexico, uh, he's the recipient of the uh, Mazatlan Literature Prize for his uh, book of um, essays, Efectos Personales and the Premio Javier Villarrutia for his book, La Casa Pierde. Uh, more recently, his uh, novel for youth, El Libro Salvaje, we have to mention that he has sold over a million copies worldwide. And among his most recent books are La Tierra de la Gran Promesa, published in 2021, Examen Extraordinario, published in 2020, and El Vertigio Horizontal, Una Ciudad Llamada Mexico in 2018. His uh, work has been translated to many uh, languages worldwide. So it is a great pleasure to have you with us, Juan. Please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Gaspar Rivera, for the invitation and for being our host. I'm really happy to be here for many reasons. Uh, first of all, because I enjoyed extremely uh, Lynn Stevens' book on Elena Poniatowska, Stories That Make History. It's uh, an extremely well-informed book, not only about uh, Elena's work, but about Mexican politics and Mexican uh, culture. Uh, Lynn Stevens uh, has uh, read all the amazing, the vast body of work of Elena Poniatowska, and uh, also all his Mexican peers, uh, people like uh, Carlos Monsiváis, uh, who was very, very important for Elena Poniatowska. So in this book, you have the context, the social and political atmosphere in which um, Elena Poniatowska's work uh, uh, was written. And also you have the biography of this um, extraordinary uh, writer, and also um, a very interesting discussion um, about the ways in which uh, uh, chronicles become part of social and political life. Uh, so um, it is a, a real pleasure to, to read this, this book. I have learned a lot of things. I have known Elena Poniatowska for more than 40 years. And nonetheless, there are also always mysteries in um, a such um, and an extraordinary character as Elena Poniatowska. Um, for a time, uh, she wrote uh, one piece a day for the newspaper Excelsior, which is um, an, an 
uh, extraordinary output. So it is impossible to cope as a reader with all the things that Elena Poliatowska has written. And uh, Lynn Stephen uh, is in touch with every single corner of Elena Poniatowska's work. So this is um, an extraordinary achievement. And also, uh, uh, Lynn Stephen goes as far as to read, for example, the memoirs of the former president, Miguel de la Madrid. You need a lot of patience to do that. And, uh, but she uh, established a very interesting contrast between the official discourse of Miguel de la Madrid and the real story told by Elena Poniatowska. So these um, different aspects of Mexican life, the official discourse and uh, the uh, real story that Elena Poniatowska was writing about the Mexican um, uh, deeds is uh, one of the strongholds of the book. And uh, Elena Poniatowska, on her own right, is one of the most colorful and interesting characters of Mexican culture. She was born in France, as uh, Lynn Stevens uh, just uh, told us, and um, uh, to an aristocratic family. She's a princess, and uh, one of uh, uh, the members of her family was uh, an important general for Napoleon. And uh, she came to Mexico when she was 10 and in a very well off uh, environment. And she learned to speak Spanish with the maids. But she not only learned this vernacular Spanish with the maids, she understood the way of thinking of the poor people. From then on, Elena Poniatowska decided that her language was going to be the language of the people without privileges. And this is uh, an important decision. It was something maybe unconscious when she was a girl, but this fostered her very original way of approaching Mexican reality. In uh, Lynn Stephen's um, book, Elena Poniatowska says something that I have uh, read for the very first time. She says that she uh, was raised in a privileged environment and this gave her a certain impunity to move in dangerous circles because um, nobody was going to touch her. But she used this privilege not to tell the story of the powerful people, but on the contrary, to understand those who had no voice. And there is another opinion that is very, very interesting in this book, in which Elena Poniatowska says, I have never wanted to give voice to the others, because this is a kind of a paternalistic attitude to say, I give you the voice that you are devoid of this um, instrument, so I am so powerful that I can give you this to you. No, for Elena Poniatowska, it was much more important to understand the people in their own means, to be part of the other. So she's sharing um, experiences that are not her own. This is a very uh, different attitude towards other people, let's say anthropologists, to um, try to do an intellectual interpretation of the people they are studying. Elena Poritoska is not studying people, is trying to understand them in a lively way. So it is very important to follow one of the leading concepts in this book, which is the emotional community uh, proposed by um, a Colombian intellectual Miriam Jimeno. Uh, according to Miriam Jimeno, it is very interesting to notice that there are certain communities that relate uh, not through uh, specific ideas, but through 
emotions, uh, through passions. And on the long run, these passions, these emotions become uh, social values. So the community is uh, put together because of the emotions, but later on, this becomes a way of understanding the community itself and the rest of the world. So it becomes a way of um, sharing ideas and it becomes an education. Elena Ponetowska's work has done exactly this. So she writes to understand the other and through the emotions that she shares because she's dealing with the actions, with the private life, with the dreams, uh, with the traumas, uh, with all the dramatism of very different individuals. Through this depiction of emotions, she creates a community. And this community can understand herself, itself, thanks to this narrative. So it's a very, very interesting way of uh, presenting a reality and transforming this reality through the text. So this is uh, the situation that uh, Lynn Stephen explores all along her fabulous book. These shared emotions that become a sense of community and that convey a sense of belonging. Um, Elena Poletowska has written about the um, 1968 uh, mo student movement in Mexico, about the Zapatista upheaval, about the earthquake and the resistance after the earthquake, about um, the Ayotzinapa students that were kidnapped, about many social issues. In all of them, she has created this sense of emotional uh, community, which I think uh, is extraordinary. And it is not surprised that Elena is not only one of the most uh, well-read um, Mexican writers, uh, she has sold more than half a million copies of La Noche de Tlatelolco, her account of this dreadful massacre of 1968, but uh, she's also a beloved person a character, a public persona. Uh, when I was in charge of La Jornada Semanal, um, the literary supplement of newspaper La Jornada, um, I, uh, I came to office, I, I remember it was in uh, March was the month, and some six weeks later, people start to call the uh, supplement asking for a special issue on Elena Poriatowska. The readers wanted Elena on the cover. And then we had Elena on the cover. And the readers wanted Elena once again on the cover. I mean, she is in perpetual dialogue with her extraordinary white readership. And this is a singular thing in a Mexican um, a culture, because as uh, you may know, and we don't have a widespread habit of reading in Mexico, but um, uh, Elena Poniatowska is something different. Uh, people read her books and want to hear her opinions on every aspect of uh, Mexican life. And it is uh, one of uh, Lynn Stephens' uh, goals to understand Elena not only as a wonderful writer, but also as a political figure, as an activist. And Elena Polintoska has crossed this line several times. I, am, I, I think that mainly on the last years. So it is not surprised that on the last part of uh, her book, Stories That Make History, uh, Lynn Stephen approaches to this situation in which Elena Poniatowska writes about our current president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, when he, when he was camping in our main square 
the Socalo, uh, protesting for the 2006 elections. And uh, there she becomes an activist. And reading uh, Lynn Stephen, I remembered a film by Mexican filmmaker Paul Leduc about uh, John Reed. As you know, John Reed was an extraordinary journalist, an American journalist, came to Mexico to cover the Mexican Revolution. And this film is about uh, this um, witness of uh, our hope, this witness of the fight against uh, injustice and uh, all the many aspects of the Mexican Revolution. But at the end of the film, there is a moment in which he approaches um, a store in which there is a camera and he needs a camera to bear witness of what he's regarding. And suddenly he decides to break the window and to take the camera. So he crosses the line. He's not the witness anymore. He's part of the revolution. He's an activist. Although he's not going to shoot with a rifle, he's going to shoot with a camera. This movement, movement, this gesture of changing the gaze of the witness and becoming involved with the situation is what Lynn Stephens described in this, describes in this chapter in which Elena Poniatowska takes part of the political movement in the Socalo and supports uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who later on uh, became Mexican president. So it is uh, amazing how all these uh, kaleidoscopic aspects of Elena Poniatowska's uh, life are put together. The writer and also the public persona and the private person with all her uh, feelings and all her sufferings also. And um, this uh, book uh, was made possible through multiple uh, interviews with Elena Poniatowska, through um, uh, trips, journeys in, in, in Mexico. Uh, so uh, really it's, it's not a work of a foreigner. It's a, it's a work of somebody who really knows this culture. And I, I am proud to say that uh, she belongs to this culture. And one of the main aspects of Elena Poniatowska's work is that she has always remained a journalist. When uh, she was awarded the Cervantes Prize, the first thing she said is, I am foremost a journalist, which is exactly what, what um, Svetlana Alexeyevich said when she was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature because a great journalism is literature under pressure. And that is what Elena Poniatowska has written. She is also the author of many novels. Um, Lynn Stephens discusses many aspects of these novels, but she concentrated, concentrates on Elena Poniatowska's journalism. And this is also a cultural um, a mark because in the last years, thanks to Elena Poniatowska and thanks to interpretations as this book by Lynn Stephen, journalism has quite a different status. Now we can speak about, about journalism as a form of art and as a form of a testimony that changes social life. Because in Mexico, in the 20th century, we had an extremely strong censorship. When the students' movement occurred in 1968, nobody would talk about this in the press, not to speak about the radio or the TV. It was forbidden to say things about the um, students, about the professors who took part in this movement according to their own ideas. It was of course possible to repeat the official discourse, but that was it. Elena Poniatowska's work was the first one 
uh, with other books quoted by uh, Lynn Stephens as Los Días y Los Años by uh, Luis González de Alba and some other books that gave the real news of that time. So Elena Poniatowska was writing against the public, the official public discourse. So her journalism became a part of our real history. So that is why her work is so important. And um, I would like to finish this brief intervention remembering um, uh, uh, some anecdotes that I had, I, I, I lived in Chiapas. Um, uh, I read in uh, Lynn Stephen's book that she was at the um, National Convention in 1994 with the Zapatistas. I was there as well. And you might remember, Lynn, that there was a terrible storm. Uh, yeah. It rained like in uh, Garcia Marquez's novel. It was a deluge. It was something terrible. Um, so next day, I, I, I realized that I was covered in mud and so on, and I wanted to see my face. And in um, the cities, we take for granted that you can have a mirror, or you take for granted yet that you can have some surface in which you can reflect yourself. But in the poor uh, con uh, uh, corners, in the poorest corners of our country, it is impossible to find a mirror. It is impossible to find a metallic surface. So I became desperate because I thought I had no, no identity. This is one of the problems of Europe, European people, you know? So I said, how come do I, do I still, have a, still have a face? So I wanted to see my face and I found um, a, a pickup van um, in the outskirts of the camping. So I went there and uh, really um, anxious to see my face on the rear view mirror. Mm. And suddenly I read this uh, uh, legend that rear view mirrors have that for the first time become like a kind of oracle. And you might remember that uh, this, this legend says objects in mirror are closer than they appear. <laughs> and I think that is the secret message of Elena Poniatowska's work. Everything that she writes is closer than it appeared on the first time. So, and we have to thank you, Lynn, for this wonderful book and uh, for demonstrating that it is possible to change history through stories. And that is always very, very important to remember that political objects are closer than they appear. Thank you, Juan, for those wonderful comments. Thank you. I wonder, Lynn, if you want to uh, uh, comment back, maybe, to something that grabbed your attention. And also, uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to ask the audience to please pose your questions in the section of Q&A so we can pose those questions to the author of the book, Lynn Steven, and also the commentator, Juan Villoro. So go ahead, Lynn, if you have any comments for Juan. Hey, well, first, Juan, thank you so much for your amazing response and your generosity. It, it means a great deal to me coming from you, another one of Mexico's very distinguished authors and cronistas, um, who I've been enjoying horizontal vertigo. Um, so yeah, I spent, I, I often visited Paquita del Barrio and some of the other places you mentioned. So I, I'm particularly honored and I have to admit I'm, um, I'm in the Convención Nacional Democrático in 1994. Or, uh, wiping the water off. Um, and actually that same day in the, I decided to, um, that I needed to go to the bathroom when the storm struck. So I left my backpack on a bunch of seats and I went, you know, where all the latrines were 
And when I came back, everyone was gone and my backpack was gone with, you know, my passport, everything in it. And it turned out the next morning when I was dripping wet, a friend who'd been sitting next to me, Neil Harvey, who's a political scientist, who's also written about Chiapas, went like from tent to tent and he found me. Um, so it was one of those minor miracles, maybe, I don't know if you were looking at the mirror at the same time or, you know, but um, it turned out to be an amazing uh, experience. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I'm just, uh, really, um, I'm so amazed that you completely get the book. I really appreciate that um, and what I was trying to do. Um, I am not a literary critic. Um, I'm not a historian. I'm an anthropologist. So um, going on the journey to write this book required sort of retooling and history uh, reading many things, but I think your understanding uh, and probably what we share is a belief in the power of stories, right? And the kind of writing that brings people to life. You know, that's really what also motivated me. And I see that, I see that so much in your work too. The power of that kind of writing of emotion, of communication, and the ability to do it in so many different forms, right? Uh, in a page and a half about a particular person or a place. Um, so I'm, again, I, I'm, I'm just delighted that I feel like the mission of the book was accomplished and understood. Um, I really appreciate it. I struggled with this book um, probably more than anything else I've written, mostly because people wanted to slot it into a particular genre, you know, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't enough about Mexico City history, or it wasn't enough about the history of publications, and it wasn't a straight up biography, but um, trying to put these different forms of thinking of writing um, together um, is something that I was really excited about, and I'm excited <laughs> that you uh, appreciated it. Um, and um, yeah, just, uh, I'll stop with that. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a journey uh, getting to know Elena. Um, unlike you, I didn't, you know, I haven't known her for a really long time. I, I know that she knows both of your parents and you. Um, and I just kind of met her, you know, here at my own university, but really uh, spent a lot of time with her and her family and accompanied her and, I think it was also really important to do things out in public with her. In some ways, I compare her to sort of the way that people in the US think about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, it, you know, she has these fans who are very young um, and really cuts across, you know, a lot of different age groups. Um, and that was that was particularly interesting to look at. And what is it about the the way this person writes and is in the world that continues to impact so many people uh, across generations. Um, so it was a process and it was, you know, initially there was a lot of, um, when I first started interviewing her, you know, I ha I, I've done a lot of testimonial work. I've done many, many interviews, not nearly as many as she, but probably in the thousands through my own work. Um, and I was treating her very nicely. And at one point she fell asleep um, and she said, this is really boring. You know, this is uninteresting. I've already written about this. And so I like, we really changed the dynamic of the conversation. I said, okay. And I started to really push back on her and ask her, you know, heart, not, not like easy questions. Um, and then she started to interview me and it, it really became much more of an exchange. And in those first few days, we had several very intimate conversations where I think we both shared with each other things that we had told very few people. Um, so that, that kind of process or sort of pushing back against her uh, and then, because I've had a lot of people when I've talked about this, they say, how could you interview her? She was really hard to interview. 
Um, you know, she just wants to tell me about her grandchildren. I mean, a lot of academics who do literary criticism have gone to her house and interviewed. I mean, there's like four or five people a day who are, you know, on the phone or coming through or, um, so it was really kind of a 10 year, you know, process of a company, I'd say accompaniment and, um, you know, getting to know her, you know, she met one of my kids who was there and, you know, so really kind of doing that uh, relationship in a lot of different ways. Um, so I'll stop with that um, and maybe, uh, people have some questions. Thank you, thank you. There's some questions uh, already in the Q&A, so let me read them and also feel free, uh, both of you, to comment and um, uh, because they're related to what both of you say. So the first one is from uh, Ariel Tumbaga, who said, you mentioned Elena's admission to her own privileges in regard to the voices she at times represent. How did you find Elena's personal and professional handling vis-a-vis -vis indigenous people or women more specifically? Thank you for the book. Lynn. Okay. okay, I can comment on that. And I would be interested to hear Juan's perspective too. Um, you know, I think um, that, that quote that uh, Juan uh, cited from the book where she talks about her own privilege, that, that actually came out of that part of the conversation through time um, where I began to push back on her to say, you know, let's recognize, you know, let's recognize, you know, this background is very different from mine. I come from a working class background um, and, uh, you know, discuss that or how, how did this come, you know, how did, how did this come to be and what does this mean and what kind of access does that give you? Um, so I think in the chapter on the Zapatistas, one of the things, one of the connections I knew that we had, um, I had at one point, I had been in, I worked in Chiapas. I wrote a book about the Zapatistas. Um, and at one point I had this idea to do a book about Comandante Ramona. Um, and I had spoken to Ramona in Chiapas and then I uh, was able to meet with Ramona um, after she had her kidney transplant. And I knew that she had been in Elena's house and you know that we had both had this interaction with her. Um, so I, and I knew that uh, I had seen, you know, through reading many things, looking at YouTube, um, that she had engaged with Zapatista women. Um, and, you know, different people have sort of had a desencanto with uh, Subcomandante Marcos through time and Elena's relationship, I think, grew rather fraught with him. Um, but she continued to, I think, really learn from and admire uh, Zapatista women and indigenous women. Um, I, I know I'm tr a friend of mine pointed out, you know, there have been a couple quotes that she's made in the press uh, about indigenous women that probably um, one might have some questions about. I have, I didn't, this is more recently, I didn't talk to her about that, but through all of her work, and this is one of the things that I think is another thread in the book, is she really, she writes about women. Um, in her chronica, she writes about women characters. One of the things I pointed out about um, La Noche de Tlatelolco is she she is the person, you know, person who really focuses at all on some of the women who were leaders in the student movement um, and follows them. Um, so her she has been communicating with and about women, not exclusively, but that is a significant part of what she has done and done as a writer and both been recognized in Mexico as a major writer. I think uh, Juan, you know, Juan's point about, you know, the way that cronistas, the way that journalism was just like this preciado, it wasn't taken seriously as writing. Um, and even in the form of the cronica, you know, I think any, anyone uh, who writes both cronicas and novels would say, you're going to get a lot more credibility with your novels than your cronicas, even in terms of, you know, prizes until really recently. But in both her novels and her chronicas, women 
um, have been really important. Um, she's done a lot of essay writing where she also wrote about Zapatista women and really the insights that they bring to the table. Um, so I think, you know, focusing on women, recognizing the contributions and the insights of indigenous women, and even the kind of vision that indigenous women have for democracy, like participatory democracy versus, I don't know, autocratic democracy, that, you know, that is a lesson from the Zapatistas um, that has stuck with a lot of people. And, you know, for example, when uh, in, the, in the chapter um, from Amanecer en el Socolo, she, she writes about engaging with these indigenous women in the road, you know, doing these stops while she's like campaigning for AMLO, um, I think in the, in, in the Yucatan. Um, and she gets all excited writing about these women and their ideas and how they're gonna participate and how we have to have discussion and we have to have dialogue. Um, so I think that's something else from the Zapatistas, but also Zapatista women that she was really animated about and, and you know, disappointed about in other, you know, spheres of politics. Juan, what do you think about that question? It's a very interesting question. And as all the interesting questions, it's, it's very difficult to, to answer it. And I think Elena Poniatowska has used her privilege uh, to have access to certain circumstances, so to certain circles, and to stay alive uh, in a very dangerous um, uh, job. Um, nowadays, um, Mexico is uh, the, the country in which more journalists are being killed. So um, it, it is not easy to cover some news. So when Elena speaks about her privileges, I think she's speaking basically about this um, capacity of um, going into a tough spot uh, without uh, dying or without being uh, in such danger as other journalists. She's um, the Mexican person that has spent more time in jail without being convicted because she has interviewed everybody that has been into prison for political reasons. So um, this is important to understand. She is uh, um, uh, confessing that she has this kind of access, but the most important part is that uh, she is not speaking um, uh, with the perspective of the privilege, just the other way around. And it's very interesting what you say, Lynn, about the Zapatista women, because I think that one of the most important trademarks in Elena Poniatowska is uh, the way he hears the other. And to write literature is something that has to do with the voice, but it has also to do with hearing other voices. And in Mexican culture, women have heard much more than men. Men are always speaking. They are constructing masculinity through public discourse. And Elena, uh, when she began to, to write for newspaper exerture, as you tell in your book, uh, she was um, uh, responsible for um, social notes, uh, the so-called social notes, parties and, and the gatherings of uh, rich people and so on. But she decided to use her access to cover other kinds of people, people uh, who have no um, voice in the newspaper. So this is the most important part, not to use the privilege to say what your class is thinking, but the other way around, to use it just like a password to hear the other and to put the voices of the other into the page. So that is why it is so important, the voices of women, because for the first time they are speaking in Mexican literature or in Mexican journalism through Elena Poniatowska's work, but not, it's not that Elena is giving them her voice, as I was telling before, it's just that she, she is giving them the possibility of express themselves. So I think th th this is the main thing about the privileges and so on. And 
I, I guess it's very, very important, of course, to acknowledge the perspective in which you are writing, the access you had to the, that special place, because that has to do the, with the uh, objective standpoint of a journalist, but also uh, to cover uh, reality as it happens. And this is why Elena Poniatowska is, uh, is, is trying to convey all the things she hear, um, and this is for her more important than the things she has to say. That is why it is so difficult to interview her because she's always asking questions. She doesn't want to give that many answers. Thank you. There's another uh, uh, interesting question in the, ch in the Q uh, question and answer. Uh, Maricela Becerra writes, in 2016, Tlatelolco Aquella Tarde by Luis Gonzalez de Alba was published. The book, in part, is a direct correction of what the author sees as mistakes in Poniatowska's La Noche de Tlatelolco. I'm curious to hear if this feud between Gonzalez de Alba and Poniatowska came up during the interviews. Um, it came up later because I asked about it. Um, and actually, I mean, I write, I write about it in that chapter. Um, and there's, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion in the press. Um, Elena has not made a lot of public comments, but um, the book was republished um, to correct parts that would, you know, should be attributed to um, Gonzalez de Alba. Um, we did talk about it. Um, Elena did not want to talk about it a lot, um, but we did, uh, we did discuss it some. Um, so I don't know, uh, Juan, if you have comments about that um, controversy. <laughs> Okay. Sounds good. And I have a, just a question on my own. Um, Lynn, you write that you were interested in uh, seeing Poniatowska's uh, literary production, uh, not only as an engaged journalist, but as a political actor. And so, um, and I know uh, Juan is a journalist too. So what are the implications of that decision too? In a way, in general, we value the journalist's perspective for their critical eye, right? With the powers that be, with political actors. Uh, and I know there has been a lot of controversies about photographs of Carlos Salinas de Guartari with the literary elite, right? And, 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 and the idea, the assumption is that uh, the powerful always maintains this critical line with intellectuals. What are the implications of Elena's moving as a full political actor? Uh, depending, you know, how do you assess that? Uh, she, um, uh, we value her work as journalists, as testimonios, as being there saying, hey, here I'm posing the voices directly from the actors. But when you say she becomes a political actor, you know, what are the implications? Should we then read her in a different way? Uh, how she maintained that critical age? I mean, she is a privilege. Uh, Juan is basically that she has a lot of privilege, a lot of accents. Can she still maintain that critical eye, that critical, uh, um, um, spirit as a journalist. And um, maybe also Juan, you have uh, something to say about this as a journalist yourself. Go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, um, first of all, I mean, as you know, Gaspar, for a long time, I've been pushing back at what we mean by politics, right? And political actor. Um, and I think, you know, in political science and in other academic disciplines, you know, we focus on formal electoral politics, we focus on formal institutions. If we bring in social movements, we, you know, we look at how they interact with the state, maybe are co-opted by the state. 
Um, but I have a more expansive understanding of political actor, right? It's someone who impacts politics, who writes strategically or acts strategically, um, knowing that they're gonna have an impact on politics. And I think it's important to take a long view on the work of Elena. Um, and that, and, you know, and that's really when you get back to writing to talk about strategy um, and that part of the strategic part of representation. Um, and what, you know, what does it mean to make a choice to lift up particular voices and publish them and have people know about them? Um, so I, I, you know, Elaine isn't, I mean, you know, she cites the who, what, where, why, when, and the para que, you know, the what for as being the really important part of journalism. Um, and no, you know, no one, if you're writing for those, as Juan has said, who don't have access to the press, right? And publishing their perspectives, um, you often get questioned, right? That you're, you're, you're biased, you're partial, right? But if you cover, uh, you know, conferences or business, um, you know, that's just normal. Um, so I think it's important to also um, push back at what we mean by politics. Um, as I said, I think Elena's a fan of participatory democracy. Um, and in, in a sense, by covering social movements, or co not that social movements can also be very non-democratic, um, but by looking at dialogue, by you know, covering movements, by going to jail and interviewing people beginning in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, um, and then publishing that, you know, I, I'm not sure that she self-consciously would say that I'm a political actor when I'm doing that. So some of that is my interpretation. I think um, when you move from and you know, this happens definitely with the Zapatistas. I it begins to happen in her work around the earthquake where, you know, she's supporting the Costurera. She was like, she was the treasurer for the Costureras for a while, raising money for them, writing about them. Um, you know, so it's, it's not like a clear bright line between this is political and this is not. If you're supporting social movements, um, if you, you know, I think what you're referring to is when she actively became involved in a political campaign in 2006. And that's, you know, for some people that's the bright line of politics, but for me, it's not. I would say she was political long before that. She was a witness, she was supporting social movements. She was opening up public spaces for them long before Yotsinapa. Um, so I think when it became deadly, probably for her in a much more 24 seven way, maybe not, but much more publicly was when she did work for Lopez Obrador and she got death threats very often. Um, you know, she continues, I think to probably get them. Um, and that privilege that Juan was talking about, that didn't matter. People were attacking her all the time, right? Because she jumped into mainstream politics um, versus the kind of attacks or the kinds of danger that comes, you know, and I'm so glad that Juan brought this up of any journalist now who covers anything that's controversial, controversial for anyone, whether it's organized crime or business or what you take your life in your hands. Um, and, and that's just tra tragic. Um, so I think that, I don't know, again, it's a complicated answer, maybe I'm wandering, but I don't think there is a bright line between being a, politi you know, a political actor or not, whether it's in the case of her or many other journalists who cover social movements, who cover you know, extraction or who cover uh, disappearances of you know, all, the, all the people who have, are disappearing, have disappeared in Mexico. Reporting that as news becomes a political act and you become a political target. So let's hear from Juan on this really interesting question. Well, uh, all texts are political and uh, you, you can um, 
have a political interpretation of any texts. And from day one, Elena Poriatowska was a very brave uh, journalist and she was a critical journalist from the start. So when she was writing in the 60s and 70s, um, government officials would say that she was a political agitator. And so uh, she was dubbed this a kind of public enemy because she was trying to tell the truth. The single fact of trying to tell the truth was um, uh, a signal of dissent. So uh, she was named political agitator when she was doing no other thing that covering reality. So from the start, Elena Poniatowska was a political writer. And she's a great journalist and a great writer because she has conveyed reality in all its contradictions and uh, raising more questions than giving answers. And that is, I think, uh, the stronghold of uh, Elena Poniatowska's achievements. But in some texts later on, uh, she has um, um, acted as a political figure. And I think it's uh, fair that an intellectual um, can write a pamphlet. Um, there are many examples uh, in the story of ideas. No? During the Enlightenment, Rousseau, Voltaire, Diderot uh, wrote pamphlets. And they are not the great uh, uh, thinkers of that time because of that pamphlets, but they try to achieve some political goals through this activism. So this, this is a side effect of the power of literature, because when Elena Poniatowska realized that she was a political figure uh, because she had a wide readership and because a lot of people were hearing her so she decided to support Lopez Obrador. Amanecer en el Zócalo is not her best work and um, if you think about the uh, Elena Ponetosca journalist but it's a very very interesting work if you think at the strategies of representing reality and how come a powerful writer can um, uh, influence uh, political movements. So um, I think that she uh, decided in a, in, 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 with the full conviction to become a political actor with this book. And I think that's very, very interesting. And I, this book was really successful and it's one of the reasons that some years later, Lopez Obrador won the presidency. Of course, as um, uh, Lin was saying, there is a high price for this because you became controversial and in a polarized society like um, the Mexican one, you have menaces and you have enemies and so on. And the people say Elena Poniatowska departed from art and from literature and he became a propagandist uh, of a populist uh, leftist, no? all the, the, the tokens no? uh, uh, that the, the, the press can use to discuss this issue. But I think uh, it, was, it was fair enough to, to decide to write a pamphlet and to act in that way. And as an anthropologist, Lin studies this other aspect of a great writer. If Elena Ponatowska would write only these kind of works, uh, she could have been regarded as an important um, uh, social fighter, but she is a social fighter of sorts because she's not always doing this uh, and she's also a great writer. And so this um, different fractal kaleidoscopic uh, personality is uh, depicted in, 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 in Lin's book. And I think that that's quite interesting. Thank you to both of you. And we're running out of time. So I wonder if there are any final closing thoughts about uh, what you see as the, the future of engaged journalism, Lynn, 
Is there a school of thought? Is Elena with uh, the white uh, readership that she has? Does this kind of genre has a, a, a future? And also maybe also Juan, do you see these, uh, 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 do you see new younger faces following on these steps of these great engaged uh, journalists? Lynn? Yeah, I do. Uh, I do think that Cronica has a great future. Um, I would love to hear from Juan on that, but I think, you know, one of the things that's really interesting, I think Juan, you wrote something I remembering about like seven different aspects of the Cronica. It's like an animal, but it's not all of these things. So it's, it's very um, creative flexible brings together you know different kinds of writing and I think that's really really appealing particularly to young people and the way that we think about chronicas you know as text I would say we also see people making chronicas on social media um, and in other ways you know even if you look at what's happening with film and film genres and how people are putting you know putting things together um, you know, in the US, it's, it's, you know, sort of literary nonfiction, which is also a very expansive uh, category and testimony. Um, I, I'm amazed at, uh, I've written quite a bit on testimony in different ways, my book on Oaxaca, and I uh, did a testimony with one of the founders of um, the Comadres in El Salvador, but testimony and the idea of testimony is very, is very hot among like graduate students and people sort of writing. Um, so I think there are, there are just all of these elements in many ways that um, chronistas, you know, like Elena, like Juan, you know, are like, they were ahead of their time, like a decade or two ago in terms of the different forms, the multiple forms of how people are expressing stories. So love to hear what Juan thinks. I would like to go back to the concept of emotional community because I think that Cronica is the best way uh, to um, associate information with emotion. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you read news uh, in the paper um, about, I don't know, terrible things, uh, catastrophes and so on. And um, these facts are... Um, uh, difficult to, to swallow, but they don't touch you because you don't know the stories, you don't know the background, you don't know the people. The only way to understand what happened is to relate uh, this public situation with single stories, with persons, with characters. Whenever, you, if you read, for example, John Hirsch's book on Hiroshima, and you see that there are special people, individuals, and each one of them has a personal destiny. And the bomb was going to destroy these kind of very particular special lives. Then you feel a strong emotion. So Kronika can uh, give you uh, the emotional aspects of news. And this has a political resonance as Lynn Stevens says in her book, because when you share emotion, you feel the urge to do something. You feel the urge to react. So uh, this is one of the main goals of journalism, uh, to foster empathy with the reader. And if the reader is involved emotionally with the things you are saying, he will try to react, to do something. It is not enough to read um, statistics about climate change. If you read about the animals, the people, uh, the, all the landscapes, what is really happening, and you feel uh, an emotional connection with that, then you have this surge to react, to do something. And that is why uh, stories can make history. So, uh, and that is why a Cronica has a great future, not only in Mexico, I think in all this troublesome world. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. And I want to thank you, Lynn, for this wonderful book, Stories That Make that makes History, Mexico Through Elena Poniatowska's Chronicles. And thank you, Juan Villoro, for your wonderful comments.